Bangladesh is a country that tragically should be much more successful than it is. It has a lot of the advantages that could have made it a rapidly developing economy. Global trade routes, a low debt to GDP ratio, access to oil, and a dense population. It even adopted the Westminster legal system, something that is loved by international investors and recognised worldwide for conducting business fairly. It had everything in place to be an economic powerhouse in a rapidly developing region, but yet it isn't. Despite all of these advantages, it's still on the UN's least developed country list. Bangladesh is a country of immense opportunity, which could easily become one of the largest industrial powers in Southeast Asia, but to understand what it would need to do to make that a reality in the future, and what has held it back in the past, we must as always answer a few simple questions. So, what were the factors that should have made Bangladesh a much more successful economy than it currently is? How did Bangladesh miss these opportunities, and is there anything it can do to turn this around and live up to its potential? After we've done all of that, we can put Bangladesh on the Economics Explained leaderboard. In the last few years, the idea of working from home has gone from a dream to a daily reality for a lot of white collar workers. But it's a definite struggle to stay productive at home when you have so many distractions just to click away. I mean, I accidentally click on YouTube and that's it. Down a rabbit hole about how to build my ideal gaming setup. And that's why I've streamlined my internet browsing by switching to Opera, the sponsor of this video. Opera's tab islands make the absolute mess of distraction into a clear direction. It's especially useful when researching for different topics at the same time. Each project gets its own tab island with just the tabs I need for that script, so I don't accidentally start shopping for new tripods. And another massive time saver is Opera AI's assistant, Aria. I use it literally every day to cut down on the amount of time it takes me to search for specifics on just about any site. And if you want to, you can put all of your messaging apps on the sidebar, so like me, you can quickly check every message before leaving them all on red. And from the very start, I turned on the amazing ad blocker and privacy tools so nobody is following everything I do when using it to sell me stuff. For a more destruction free browser, click on our link to try Opera for free. Once you try it, you won't want to go back. Bangladesh, as it exists today, really got started in 1971 after one of the deadliest natural disasters in modern history. The Bolas cyclone hit the region in November 1970, killing an estimated half a million people. Before that, Bangladesh was known as East Pakistan, a cut-off region divided by India that existed like this for nearly 25 years before its eventual independence. Colonial England was kicked out of what was then colonial India, forming the boundaries of West Pakistan and East Pakistan in 1947. By haphazardly drawing up those borders, the British ended up dividing political control in the West, and the people in the East were not happy about this. Starting in 1970s, tensions were high, and talks of independence were brought to a head when one of the single deadliest natural disasters in modern history, the Bola Cyclone, hit in November of 1970, killing an estimated half a million people in the East. That's four Hiroshimas that happened over the course of just six days. The government in the West failed to bring relief, and people in the East felt angry and left to strike out on their own. On top of the casualties from the cyclone, a lot of people died in the struggle for the country's independence, which was fought out over nine months from March to November of 1971. At the same time, India was fighting with Pakistan, while the war for independence between East Pakistan and West Pakistan was going on, and this in and of itself became a proxy for the Cold War. The world's superpowers at the time, the US and the Soviet Union, were vying for control and influence in the region, and these conflicts were a catalyst for a lot of global tensions. The US didn't want to get involved in the Indo-Pakistan conflict because Pakistan was an ally of China. Meanwhile, between the time East Pakistan declared itself the independent nation of Bangladesh and the time it was actually recognised as an independent nation, India signed a friendship treaty with the Soviet Union, who pledged their support for East Pakistan. And so the two world superpowers found themselves on opposing sides of the Indo-Pakistan war with the Bangladesh Liberation War happening as well, nearly igniting tensions to the highest point in the Cold War. The conditions on the ground in Bangladesh at this time were so bad that the average life expectancy dropped noticeably over just the span of two years surrounding its push for independence. Starting a new country is never easy, but starting one under these kinds of conditions meant that Bangladesh was almost doomed to fail from the beginning. There was a rapid onset of a natural disaster followed by a civil war and the death and devastation that both left in their wake, plus a regional conflict with potential global consequences of nuclear weapons, and this all happened in the first year of Bangladesh's existence. Now, it wasn't all bad, and since then conditions in and opportunities for the country have improved significantly, even if it's still bearing the scars to this day. Bangladesh boasts several strong economic characteristics, including access to global trade routes, a low debt to GDP ratio, access to oil, and a dense population, so even with its tragic history, it could have been a major regional power. But beyond just the rough start, there are more foundational problems that stand in its way. When a country is a low-cost exporter, it's usually because that country has a comparative advantage in producing items as cheaply as possible. Comparative advantage simply means that one national or state economy or economic system can produce more of one particular output for the same amount of given inputs. Inputs can be labour, how much manpower is it going to take and how much are those hours worth, or materials, how efficiently can an economy turn steel into cars, or even time, how quickly can an economy produce a given good or service. 
The country might very well be able to produce something like a smartphone more efficiently than China or South Korea, but if it takes them decades to make enough to meet consumer demand, they're still going to be less desirable manufacturing hubs than these established economies. This is particularly important for Bangladesh. Of course, most commonly all of these variables are simply considered together with the sole input being money. For example, how much money is it going to cost to produce a million units of a television? Whatever country can do it for less has the comparative advantage. Altogether, the weight of these inputs gives certain countries a comparative advantage producing certain goods and services, but no country has a comparative advantage in absolutely everything. China, for example, has fantastic export infrastructure, relatively low wages by global standards, and a government that's amenable to let industries do what they want with very little oversight to things such as environmental regulations. They also have large economies of scale with a huge population, widespread industrial know-how, and a tight geographic concentration of other manufacturers for component parts, allowing them to get really good at producing low-cost consumer goods and develop a reputation for doing just that. They can produce something like a toaster with less total inputs than an economy like the USA would, not only because their workers demand lower wages, but also because other manufacturing expenses are cheaper within China. But that's okay, because the USA, for example, has the comparative advantage in engineering and technical development. Well, most of the time because they have a financial system that really incentivizes capital investment for research and development, and a market that encourages entrepreneurship. It motivates people to get out and develop new technologies and new products that can be exported around the world, paying very high salaries and attracting talented people at the top end. And this gives the USA a comparative advantage in producing advanced services and technical development, medicines and pharmaceuticals, as well as the technology that a country like China is just better at manufacturing. So the comparative advantages of China versus the comparative advantages of the USA are different. Now, Bangladesh's comparative advantage today is in textiles. And why is that? Well, textiles are very, very cheap. Garments and goods like that are very labour intensive, so it's hard to automate the production of a t-shirt where there are different sizes. It's so difficult to automate that even a technologically superior economy like China, which is right next door, can't compete because it's so manpower intensive. The comparative advantage here is with the country that has the largest supply of really cheap manpower, and that's Bangladesh. This is okay for now, but if Bangladesh wants to make the transition from a least developed country to a middle income country, it's going to need to transition from a labour intensive economy to a capital intensive one. This shift is important because capital intensive economies need to attract foreign investment. A country like the US has the highest concentration of capital investment in the world because it's really where people go to invest their money. But most of what Bangladesh exports is our shirts and our garments because they're also labour intensive to produce, and no country can become advanced by exporting t-shirts, so they need to transition to other capital intensive activities so they can start to gain a comparative advantage in other things. Unfortunately, South Asia is a region with a lot of competition, and the trade agreements that make it a low-cost exporter as a least developed country all but disappear once it becomes a middle-income country. So then, why is it important to make this shift? Well, an economy that is open to trade and investment with the rest of the world is important for sustained GDP growth, and Bangladesh has all of the ingredients to grow. Access to global trade routes, been a low-cost exporter, and unrealised export diversification in both goods and trade partners. If a country doesn't diversify its exports enough to grow, it could result in a trade deficit, which is when a country's imports are in excess of its exports. It also leaves a country more vulnerable to external shocks or unexpected events that impact an economy like the COVID-19 pandemic or the current crop of global conflicts. And when Bangladesh has a trade deficit with one of the countries it imports from, it has to borrow the difference, which leads it to rely on external development financing, for example, from the International Monetary Fund or the IMF, to fix it. But Bangladesh has mostly avoided this for now because it does have one other surprising financial trick up its sleeve here. Remittances, which is the earnings of foreign currency that external migrants send back to their home country. Beyond just being a source of revenue to keep paying for all those extra imports, this flow of foreign currencies adds a layer of stability to its foreign exchange reserves. Having enough foreign exchange reserves also helps a country maintain a stable foreign exchange rate, which boosts confidence in its economy. Most low-income countries like Bangladesh heavily rely on remittances, especially because the money received from someone working abroad is most, if not the only source of income for a household, which affects how much money people in that household spend on goods and services in Bangladesh, which contributes to its GDP growth. Measuring all of these economic indicators accurately is crucial for any country. And while most advanced economies have reliable and timely data used by policymakers and economists to make decisions, this is one of the pain points for Bangladesh. So much so that it has not been able to develop a credible statistical system and instead issues data full of inaccuracies and anomalies. And in developing countries there is a higher potential for it to succumb to political pressure by ruling parties by way of data manipulation to serve a larger agenda. The authenticity of GDP numbers released by the Bangladeshi Bureau of Statistics has been questioned and then there's a lack of transparency around the export statistics released by the country's Export Promotion Bureau. For example, the EPB claimed that commodity exports had risen by 6.7% at the end of the fiscal year in 2023, but another one of the country's statistical agencies, the National Board of Revenue, said no, exports actually declined by 5%. 
That lack of coordination between the different reporting agencies creates chaos for policymakers and economists who use that data to make important economic policy decisions. Bangladesh is in a critical point in its 50 plus year history. It's about to graduate from the UN's least developed countries list, where it has capitalised on its labour intensive economy with trade agreements that make it an ideal export partner. However, it needs to take care of a few areas. First, Bangladesh needs to find new comparative advantages which will hopefully help it to expand its trade partners and diversify the goods and services it exports. This means it also needs to capitalise on trade with its neighbours in a region where it actually does hold some underutilised comparative advantages. For example, Bangladesh is the number one exporter of pharmaceuticals to Myanmar, a relationship that could be expanded. And today, trade between Bangladesh and South Asian neighbours such as India, Thailand and Nepal only represents 9% of the country's global trade, and it's not alone. South Asia is one of the fastest growing regions in the world, but inter-regional trade amongst the countries is the lowest in the world. Second, it needs to shift to a capital intensive economy. The country has relied on its unskilled labour force to achieve comparative advantage in textiles and ready-made garments, and the country also exports that labour force which brings foreign currency back into circulation. But it needs to upskill the labour force it exports overseas so it can sustain a steady flow of remittances as it transitions to a middle income country. Third, the country needs to coordinate its major economic indicator data releases between the different reporting agencies so there is more transparency and data integrity. What happens if Bangladesh fails to do this? Look what happened to Sri Lanka when it graduated from the least developed countries list. Unstable balance of payments, low foreign direct investment and a lack of export diversification all contributed to the country's almost spectacular failure in 2021, a fate that is hopefully not repeated in what could be one of the most promising economies in the region. Okay, now it's time to put Bangladesh on the Economics Explained leaderboard. Starting as always with size, Bangladesh has a GDP of 460.2 billion US dollars which makes it the 35th largest economy in the world, just behind Singapore and just ahead of Iran. It gets a 7 out of 10. That GDP is impressive for a low income country, but spread out over a population of 171.1 million people. Which means that its GDP per capita is only $2,668, way below the global average of $12,235. The opportunities are there and its growth is steady, but for now Bangladesh gets a 3 out of 10. Stability and confidence are probably better than what most people expect, and while the country has sustained stable GDP growth for nearly all of its existence despite government issues including corruption, it has been a consistent trade partner with countries a continent away. Long term Bangladesh is going to need to clean up these issues in order to achieve export diversification in both goods and trade partners, but for now it gets a 5 out of 10 as it navigates an uncertain decade ahead. Growth has been strong, almost tripling in size in the last decade thanks to favourable trade agreements that make it a low cost and duty free exporter for certain trade partners. However, that isn't sustainable because those agreements expire when Bangladesh graduates from the least developed countries index. But for now, it gets a 10 out of 10. Finally, industry. Its comparative advantage in ready made garments relies on labour intensive manpower that is cheap and exports to countries far from its borders. It needs to diversify its exports to support a shift to a capital intensive economy that develops new technologies and find more trade partners closer to its borders to support that transition, which it is starting to, but not just yet. So a 5 out of 10. Altogether that gives Bangladesh an average score of 6 out of 10, a respectable result thanks to its strong growth that puts it here on the leaderboard. This video mentioned Sri Lanka, a warning about what a country like Bangladesh should not do when going through a similar economic situation, so if you're curious to see how that unfolded, click the video on the screen now. Thanks for watching mate. Bye.